Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning here at Grace Congregational United Church of Christ. Thank you for being with us as we worship God together. If there's any folks who have announcements this morning, I want to invite them to come on up. And while they're coming up, um, know that after our service of worship next door in the Fellowship Hall is Time After Church, hosted today by Keith and Sue Shaw. So please come um, spend a little more time together and enjoy their hospitality. Know also that during our worship service, we'll be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion together. Here on the baptismal font is gluten-free bread, if that is a need you have. Paul. Good morning. Once again, Grace Church is going to be participating in the uh, Christmas bulbs for trip. We don't have a lot. Uh, I have got 10 this year, and I have a table back there. And uh, if you would like to participate, pick up a bulb. The gifts are to be brought back to Grace Church by no, uh, December 4th. And a uh, re reminder, don't wrap them. We want them unwrapped and we want to be able to inspect what, what has been given. And if you do wrap them, I have to unwrap them again. So. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. So that is Christmas gifts for local families um, who use our food pantry in town. Uh, if you'd like to, to have that um, giving spirit of, of helping somebody out, but those bulbs are all gone, we still do have in the gathering area the turkey filled with feathers that our Sunday school children have put together. They're collecting items um, to help uh, foster care kids in our community so there's more information on in the bulletin about that but you can also check out the turkey itself in the gathering area um, other a couple other updates is just that uh, if you ordered a Christmas wreath from our ASP crew the wreaths um, are done we finished them over a thousand wreaths we made uh, they're being decorated this week and then will be uh, either delivered to you or available for pickup. Uh, you have to be in touch with whoever you ordered a wreath from. They, whoever ordered, you ordered from uh, is the one who organized it. So if you ordered through the church, if you called the church office or sent an email or Facebook message to the church, then I am the one to talk to. Uh, but otherwise, if you order directly from one of the youth or people going on the trip, um, they will contact you about, about delivery or what that looks like. Uh, today is Christ the King Sunday, as you'll hear a little bit about later, but just want to point that out, that this is uh, the New Year's Eve of the Christian calendar, the liturgical year that we celebrate as a church. Um, the new year begins every year with Advent. So next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. That's the start of the new year. And today, Christ the King Sunday is the final Sunday of our year. So just pay attention to that. There's a little bit of um, info on the back of the bulletin for it, but you'll hear more about it in the worship service too. Let us now prepare our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls for the worship of God.
Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Come, O house of Jacob. Please pray with me. O God, beyond time, we are an impatient people. As the days grow shorter and the darkness longer, teach us to wait with faithful expectation. In this time of worship, open our eyes and hearts to the blessings in our midst. May every day be a day of gratitude for your compassion and grace. Through the guidance of your spirit, lead each one of us in the pathways that make for peace. In the name of Emmanuel, God with us, we pray. Amen. We gather together as a community of God's people, anticipating hope, praying for peace, attempting to cultivate joy and share love amidst commotion, grief, despair, and uncertainty. Will you pray with me? In a world full of hopelessness, we have sometimes forgotten that you are our hope, dear God. Consumed by the chaos of the world, we lean into helplessness instead of your loving embrace. We cling to the stony roads and the bitter rods felt in the days when unborn hope had died. We'd forgotten that you promised us hope for a future. So stimulate our memory, dear God. Remind us of that hope you assured us of. Be with us as we cling to your promises to us in the midnight hours of waiting. Let us know that God gives us unmerited hope for a future, peace like a river, joy everlasting, and love. No misstep can separate us from the gifts of God. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Owen Moore, and I'm going to be reading Psalm 122. Later in the reading from Isaiah, we will hear a call for all the world to go up to the Lord's mountain in Jerusalem. In Psalm 122, we hear a similar call to gather and worship God, united together in peace. Please pray with me. I rejoice with those who said to me, let's go to the Lord's house. Now our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city joined together in unity. That is where the tribes go up, the Lord's tribes. It is the law for Israel to give thanks there to the Lord's name. Because the thrones of justice are there, the thrones of the house of David. Pray that Jerusalem has peace. Let those who love you have rest. Let there be peace in your walls. Let there be rest in your fortifications. For the sake of my family and friends, I say, peace be with you, Jerusalem. For the sake of the Lord, our God's house, I will pray for your good. And now, a reading from the Gospel. Today's Gospel reading comes from a section of Matthew um, that we know as the Sermon on the Mount, and it's right after the Beatitudes. Jesus offers these words. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on the hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Owen, for reading our scriptures this morning. I would like to invite Ford, any children who are present with us this morning, come up and join me for a moment. Good morning. How are you? Good. You want to have a seat on the steps? Come on up. I did. I did. Come on over, Isla. Come on over, Aiden. It's good to see you today. How are you both doing? Good. Okay. Can you stop that so we can listen? So, today is a special day that we call Christ the King Sunday. And it's a day that we remember um, that Jesus is our King. And what we mean by that is that Jesus is more important to us, and he's the one that we should listen to and follow more than anybody else in this world. So Jesus is king, and the other leaders of this world are not. No president is king, and no governor is king, and no principal is king. Our, our parents aren't kings. Nobody else is king except for Jesus. That's what we remember today, that Jesus is the most important and the one that we should listen to and follow. And so we remember that every Sunday. If you want to turn around and look at this right here. We remember this every Sunday with this symbol that we have. And you can, you can find this all over our church if you open your eyes and look for it. We've got this big one up here. But they're also on, um, on the Bibles that we have in the church pews and some other places. You can see it around the church. And what this means, the cross reminds us of Jesus. Hold on, hold on. I'll get there in a second. The cross reminds us of Jesus, and what do you think this crown on top means? He's the king. Yes, this crown on top is meant to remind us that Jesus is the king. So every time we see this, we can remember that. But I thought today, because it's Christ the King Sunday, I would give you a different way to remember it, and that is by having your own crown. Would you like your own crown to help yes. remember that? Okay. Okay, you sit there. Sit down, sit down, sit down. So I'm going to put a crown on each of you, okay? I'm going to come to you last. <laughs> All right, so here's a crown to remember that Jesus is king. Here's a crown to remember that Jesus is king. 
here's a crown to remember that Jesus is king. What? What's so funny? What's so funny? Why'd you flip it around? Because that's the way it should be if it was a king. Oh, I put them on upside down? Yeah, if it's a knight, it should be like this. Well, you know what? I put it on upside down on purpose to also help us remember that even though Jesus is king, Jesus is a different kind of king than the kings that we think of, like kings and knights and stuff like that. Jesus, we say, is an upside-down sort of king. And it doesn't mean that he actually wore a crown upside down. But it, what it means is that most kings try to control people with power or with big armies or by having lots of money and things like that. And Jesus wasn't that kind of king at all. Jesus did not have a lot of money. He did not have a strong, powerful army. Instead, he loved people, and he cared for people. So he was a different kind of king. So on Christ the King Sunday, we remember that Jesus was king, but that he was a different king than kings of this world, and that he kind of took some things and turned it upside down. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus, who shows us by his own life and example how to live. The power in this world, true power, is not about wealth or about big armies or controlling things, but instead is about love and service. Help us remember God, to look to Jesus as the example of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Handbells. Last week, our reading was from the prophet Micah, that famous line that is on many a keychain t-shirt and bumper sticker, God has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Micah, if you remember from our discussion last week, was a prophet who lived on the fringes of society. He lived out in the countryside and spoke harsh words of critique to those rulers and elites in Jerusalem about the choices that they had made while protecting themselves that had dire consequences for those who were lower on society's ladder. Those like Micah, who lived outside of the major cities and saw their farmlands and their homes destroyed 
by the invading foreign armies while the rulers were safe in Jerusalem. Today, we read from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah and Micah were contemporaries. They lived at the same time, both in that range of about 700 years before Jesus. But while Micah spoke from the edges of society, Isaiah was one of what we call a central prophet, one who worked for the king from within the king's court. These prophets still did often speak words of critique to the king and others in power, but they did it from an entirely different position and relationship. We'll hear in the reading today that when King Hezekiah doesn't know what to do, he goes to the temple to pray, and he sends people to Isaiah to get Isaiah's take on the situation. Our reading today is complicated in that there's a number of tricky names and it's easy to get lost in the back and forth of what's happening. But the basics of our story today is this. The Assyrian army, having already destroyed the northern Israelite capital of Samaria, is now marching towards the southern capital, Jerusalem. Assyria's king sends his Rabshakeh, A Rabshakeh was a particular position within the Assyrian army. It literally means cup bearer. Basically, the Rabshakeh was the king's right-hand man. And so the king of Assyria sends his Rabshakeh to Jerusalem. And the Rabshakeh spouts some pretty strong political propaganda, as we'll hear, to attempt to convince the people of Judah to jump ship and join the Assyrians instead. Judah's king, Hezekiah, hears about this, and in his distress over the war that he knows is coming, he sends word to Isaiah to get his advice. Isaiah says that God says not to be afraid, that God will take care of it. Finally, in the last section of our reading today, we rewind within the text of Isaiah to hear words from the prophet that speak a vision of peace. In a time of so much war and anxiety and suffering and pain, Isaiah speaks of God's desire for a future of our world where people spend their time and energy and resources not on harming each other and destroying life, but on caring for each other and cultivating life. Hear now this reading from the prophet Isaiah, starting in chapter 36, the first verse, and listen for a word from God. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib of Assyria came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. The king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah of Jerusalem with the great army. He stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And there came out to him Elikayim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Aspeth, the recorder. So these are members of the court of of Jerusalem. Then the Rebshekah stood and called out in in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you rely on the Lord by saying the Lord will surely deliver us. The city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from your own vine and your own fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come to take you away to a land that is like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you by saying the Lord will save us. Has any of the gods of the nation saved their land out of the hands of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Shepharim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of these countries have saved their countries by my hand, 
that the Lord should save Jerusalem out of my hand. When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna the secretary, and the senior priests, covered in sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard the words of the Rebshekah, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer to the remnant that is left. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. I myself will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight and bring you glory, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Ancient warfare was brutal. Warfare in any age is abhorrent, but in ancient times, it was all the worse. There's a line from just outside of the text that we read today, when the Rab Shaka comes to speak to the people. And at first, those advisors to King Hezekiah that we heard, Elikim, Shebna, and Jonah, they ask the Rabshakeh to speak to them not in Hebrew, but in Aramaic, a language that they, as advisors to the king, speak, but the regular local people would not. They don't want the regular people of Jerusalem to hear the message that the Assyrian king brings through the Reb Shaka. But the Reb Shaka says back to them that he very specifically wants these regular people to hear his message. They deserve it. They deserve to hear it, he says, because the outcome of this war will affect them too. That's my paraphrase of the words. What he actually says in Isaiah 36 is that he's come to speak to the people because they are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine. Ancient warfare was brutal. And so the Rabshaka speaks his message in the language that the regular people can understand. And he says to them basically, our army is too strong. Don't put your trust in Hezekiah. He can't save you. Don't put your trust in God. Your God cannot save you. Just think about all those other nations and all the other places that we've already conquered. Could their kings or their gods save them? What makes you think that you have any chance to stand against us? So the Assyrian king comes with this message and offers to the people an alternate way of salvation. Come out to us. Give yourselves up, and we will allow you to stay here briefly, eating from your own vines and fig trees, 
until we send you off somewhere else. But it won't be so bad, he says. You will still have vines and fig trees in a land not unlike your own. The Assyrian king is offering salvation to the Judean people. A type of salvation, anyway, that is based on the things that you need to have a seemingly comfortable life. Your own vine and your own fig tree. Life in a land of grain and wine, olive oil and honey. A life of abundance and good fortune. And all the people have to do, he says, is come out of the city. Come out from behind the walls and barricades of the Jerusalem and surrender yourself to Assyria. The people of Judah are being given a choice. Who will they trust? Who has power in their life? Who has authority over them? Leave behind what you know, the Reb Shekha says, and surrender to us. It won't be so bad. The Assyrian king is offering salvation to the people, release from the horror of war, and life in a land of good and plenty. But what strikes me as I hear these words from the king's messenger, the Reb Sheka, is that this salvation is offered to the Judean people not as a whole people, but it's offered to them each as individuals. It's not come out and we will spare your people, but come out from this place and we will spare you. The king is not necessarily going to stop waging war on Jerusalem. Accept his offer, and maybe you will be safe, and your family might be safe, but your neighbors, no. That city that you called home, and the temple that is the house of your God, your workplace, and every other person and place and thing that you knew, all of it will be attacked, ransacked, and destroyed. Accepting this promise from the king of Assyria means that you will be saved, but not your community. King Hezekiah hears of all this, and he sends a message to the prophet Isaiah. This is a day of distress, the king says, of rebuke and of disgrace. Children have come to birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard the words of the Reb Shekah, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. It's like it's time for a child to be born, the king says, and there is no strength left to birth them. Childbirth is messy, and it is stressful, and it is dangerous. We forget that sometimes with the options and backup plans that modern medicine has given to us. But before the time of medical intervention, if it was the time for the baby to be born, either the baby is born or everybody dies. There's no alternative, no turning back. King Hezekiah is using this metaphor of childbirth with no strength left to say to his people, look, we are on the cusp of something amazing, a miracle of new life, a fresh chance to live as God's people. Yes, we are exhausted. Yes, we are scared. But keep going. If we give up now, that's the end. We have to keep pushing, keep going through. I don't know if it's the times that we're living in, in our world right now, or if it's just myself feeling like I'm getting older. But I so resonate with what King Hezekiah says here with this feeling of exhaustion. How do we find the energy to keep trying, to keep moving things forward when it seems like everything we do for good turns out not in the long run? Perhaps it's a question of where we put our ultimate trust which returns us to the issue of salvation. Assyria offers to the people of of Judah a deliverance, a salvation, but one that is short-sighted and individually focused. True salvation from God is long-term work and community focused. It's not just about me, it's about all of us doing the right thing together. 
Isaiah's vision of people coming to God on the mountain speaks to that. It's not just any one person being saved, but everyone in the world living together in peace with God as judge and arbiter. Instead of spending money and resources on war, which only leads to exhaustion, all of that goes instead to creation, to sustaining and cultivating and nourishing life. This will happen, Isaiah says, in days to come sometime in our future. It's not at the end of time or something otherworldly in that sense. We don't know when, but someday it will come, Isaiah says, a new way of life will be born. Perhaps we are on the cusp of it, if only we have the strength to carry on and continue to see it through. Often, when we study the Bible, we talk about people's names and the meanings behind them. Just this week, in studying the scripture, I learned that Isaiah's Hebrew name is Yeshayahu. Isn't that fun? Yeshayahu. So Yeshayahu means Yahweh is salvation. God is our salvation. Not armies or kings, foreign or our own. Not success, not money, not even freedom or safety. God is salvation. May it be so. Amen. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we come here as your people called into relationship with you and with one another to fulfill a mission in this world whose meaning we yet dimly see. Grant to us, those who seek and try to be your people and to do your work, a secure sense of our identity in you as people of rich human lineage, as children of your promise, as nobodies unless you claim us as your own. Make us, God, impatient with any identity that does not propel us forward into the struggle for justice, liberation, peace, and salvation for all. Distribute among us, your people, gifts of faith, and prayer, of prophecy and discernment, of love and hope, that we may never cease to do your will. We come to you, God, with joy in our hearts, but also with struggle and with sorrow. For there are so many ways that our world does not resemble the world that we know you want for us. There is suffering, there is pain, there is hunger, there is hopelessness. Some of it, God, seems to be the outcome of circumstances which are so beyond our control. And some of it comes at the hands of humans harming one another. Help us, God, to continue in hope and strength and courage and love as your people doing your work in this world. We pray for those who are grieving, and we especially lift up prayers for Mel and Mary Jean as they grieve the loss of Mel's sister. And we pray for those we know who are sick or who are recovering. We pray for those in our community and across our country and around the world who are cold, who are hungry, do, who do not have a safe place. God, be with them, be with us, be with the powers of this world, that we might work together for a better future. We are grateful that you have called to us in our lives, that you give us the hope and courage that sustains us and cultivates joy. And we join our voices together as your people, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Let us share our generosity with each other and the community. The morning offering will be received. Pray with me. For the wonderful way the offerings will bless the community, we dedicate these gifts. For the ways it'll help us live out God's mission, we dedicate these gifts. Let these gifts strengthen our call to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. Amen. You may be seated. In the United Church of Christ, we practice what we call open table communion, which means whether you are a member or a guest, you are invited to take the sacrament with us. May the approaching God be with you. In the days to come, people of God, offer your hearts to the one who comes near. Now is the time to sing praises to the one who loves us. You spoke of the days to come, architect of life, when ant hills would erupt from dirt, when cattle would gather under shade trees, when wild creatures would nurture little children, when chaos would be transformed into creation, and when we would stand within your garden of goodness. All this beauty, all the wonder was offered so that we might walk in your light. But we preferred the shadows of sin, opening our hearts so that thief, death, could come and steal us away from you. You sent the prophets to us, urging us to lay aside our foolishness, but we continued to put on the armor of apathy and anger so we could rebel against you. Finally, when no one expected, you came, not in power but poverty, a crying baby born to nobodies. With those who worry about your return, with those who have forgotten to tell time, we sing of your praises. 
Holy, holy, holy are you, God of the welcoming heart. All creation sings of your great love. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes when we least expect. Hosanna in the highest. In days to come, God of life, may we re be reminded of your holiness and the blessing of your child, Jesus. When we fear what lies over the horizon, he comes, arms filled with grace. When worries fall like leaves on our lives, he stands on the front porch, arm in arm with hope. When the rumblings of angry rhetoric waken us in the night, he lullabies us with songs of your love. When sin would lock us away in the shadows of death, he comes like a thief in the night to steal our hearts back for you. As we near the time when we take our journey to Bethlehem, as we seek to be alert and awake, we would proclaim this mystery of faith. Christ died, seeking the good for all. Christ was raised, putting on resurrection's love. Christ will come precisely when we least expect him. Now pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and cup and on those gathered in these moments. Feed us with the, with the bread that is broken so in the days to come we may bring healing to the shattered. Embrace the lonely, invite strangers to our family feasts. Pour the grace of the cup into us so, so that in the days to come we may wrap others in warm coats, lay aside our differences, walk with others in the light of justice. And when you come, when we least expect to bring all history to an end, gather us around the table of joy, where we will join our sisters and brothers of every place and time in forever praising you, God in community, holy and one. Amen. As Christians have done throughout the centuries and around the world, we gather around this table, God's table. And we remember that story of the last night of Jesus' life where he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and shared it with them and said, this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and pouring it out, he blessed it and shared it with them and said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this each time you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so we share these gifts together with one another, uniting with God and with Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are ready.
I invite you to rise as you are able and join with me in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, we thank you for calling us as your people, to charging us with doing your work in this world, and for gathering us here around your table where we can be strengthened and encouraged for the journey. Be with us, body and spirit, that as we leave from this place and go out into the world, we may take your grace and your love and your courage with us always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. words with you as you go. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. Support the faint-hearted. Help the afflicted and the weak. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, who is creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all, be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. And all the people said,